Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Rogers. I'm the executive director for the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce. Welcome this morning to what uh, will be a powerful hour. We've got a lot to cover. Um, some great guests that have joined us for our uh, special edition of Business Smarts here at the Kelowna Chamber. I want to thank all those that have uh, joined us online. We have a pretty good participation list. A reminder to all those that are joining us, uh, we are uh, recording this session, so uh, we will make that available afterwards. Be uh, Please be conscious of that. If you haven't been on our webinars uh, and Zoom in the past, just a reminder that there is a Q&A function, a question and answer button right at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can pose that at any time, um, and then we'll get to it as we move through our introductory comments. You can also use the chat function to have a chat uh, with the panelists. If you prefer to pose your question or comment in that regard, that's fine too. We'll be monitoring that as we move forward. Subject matter, key considerations for adapting to the new normal, and even that phrase itself. Um, is this the new normal? Um, is it just a hybrid? Uh, we are in changing times, uh, but reasonable uh, situations are rising. We're, we're, we're working through this. Uh, in British Columbia, we're in phase two. We're seeing challenges, but uh, we're entrepreneurs. Uh, we're creative. We will find a way through this. And the other component, if we don't have the answers, we likely know people that have them. Um, and that includes our guests from BDO that have joined us this morning. Uh, this is probably our seventh uh, Business Smart session since uh, COVID uh, and the pandemic uh, first took hold here in British Columbia. Um, and as we said at the start in this journey, uh, you, there are probably some folks you want to get to know really well. Uh, your banker and your accountants, get to know them really well. It's going to help uh, as we uh, move through this. Um, and that's applicable for any organization, whether you're a small business, whether you're a large uh, nonprofit corporation um, or any other uh, type of organization, I think what you'll hear this morning will certainly be um, beneficial for you. I want to thank, uh, before beginning, our uh, pillar members. In fact, I'll thank all our chamber members. We're one of the largest uh, chambers in British Columbia, and that's only because we've got great support of the small businesses and many organizations many uh, nonprofits that are a part of the Kelowna Chamber. We've been around since 1906 and continue to work hard in building a stronger uh, economy and a more resilient community. Want to thank our uh, foundational partners, Interior Savings, BDO, uh, the guests that have joined us this morning, the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, and MNP Accounting Consulting and Tax. Our guest speaker is this morning. We have three uh, with you. I will uh, formally introduce you, then I'll open up the cameras so they can uh, provide some background as well. Christine Simpson is partner and the lead for the nonprofit uh, group at BDO. She's over 24 years of experience in general accounting, audit, and tax practices. She leads the uh, nonprofit uh, industry sector for uh, BC, for BDO, and works with clients in all subsectors, including membership organizations, regulatory bodies, education, health, and housing. Um, I'm, I'm reading your bio, Christine, and where does it say former chair of uh, the board for the- Former as of Friday, I think, yes. Breathing a little easier, are you, Christine? Now you're, you're the- I am, except there. we're, yeah, except that we're in a pandemic and I'm the accountant in the room, so still there. <laughs> good point, good point. Uh, Ryan Burkholz is the business development executive consulting for nonprofit organizations. Ryan's got uh, 10 years of experience as Microsoft sales certified professional focused on planning and scoping technology solutions dedicated to the nonprofit industries in Western Canada. Uh, great to have you uh, with us, Ryan, this morning. Thanks for joining us. Our third guest is John Asher, senior manager, Western Region lead risk advisory services. Um, John leads BDO's uh, risk advisory practice in Western Canada, 16 years of professional experience. He's a chartered professional accountant, chartered accountant, certified internal auditor. Um, it's interesting, the acronym CIA. So you can walk around and say, yes, I'm, uh, I work for the CIA. I don't know. Uh, but certified internal auditor, that's great. Uh, John, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Um, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. 
Um, it's great to have you with us. Um, and want to make sure we work through and be most effective through the hour. So, uh, Christine, I'm going to turn things over to you uh, to walk us through. And a reminder uh, for folks, if you have questions that have arisen, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom or use the chat. Uh, Christine, I'll, I'll turn things over to you at this time. Thank you, Dan, so much for having us today. Um, we really appreciate being a partner with the Kelowna Chamber. Um, and please just wave at me if anything, if you can't hear me or we need to stop or something. Julie's going to run the slides for us. I just want to remind everybody, if you don't know much about BDO, we are a community-based firm with all the services, as Dan mentioned, accounting and tax, but more full service, all the consulting services that you would need from a big or small firm. And we really have a, we would say a big firm with a small firm attitude and approach, very invested in uh, SMEs, entrepreneurs, as well as not-for-profits. So our focus today was originally focused around not-for-profits, which is why I'm here. Um, but the concepts we're talking about are very general and um, they can apply to all small businesses as well. So a long time partnership with the Chamber Network through BDO, through our 15 offices across BC. Um, at one time, I believe we had six different partners who were board on the boards of chambers and or chairs. So we really truly have um, a great relationship with the chamber. So um, as uh, Dan mentioned, I do have two partners, uh, two partners in crime here. They both have beards, so they might not be recognizable on the street, but they are, they are who they say they are, and they are going to help me through this presentation, and we'll go through there. So first off, I'm going to go to the next slide, and we're going to talk about why now. Um, we're talking about the new reality, as Dan mentioned, and it really is, um, we're in, what I would say, we're past the first little hump. We're all trying to get adapted to the new normal, but we're also trying to think of where is this going to go in the future and what will our new reality look like? And I, for most of us, I think we're not really sure. And this is a, what I would say an opportunity, an opportunity to um, embrace change. People are ready for change. Um, we've realized now that we can do things differently. Um, if we had spoken uh, five, six months ago, I would say most of my clients would say, we can't do that. That's too hard to change. People will get on board. And I think what we've done right now is we've proven that we can operate differently. And so I really think we're at a stage where we have an opportunity to change more and leverage on this uh, new reality or potential new reality. So Julie, if you don't mind moving to the next slide, we're just going to talk through a few of the areas within um, what we are going to encourage you to think about right now. Um, first off, with all my clients, I always hear I don't have enough time. And as I mentioned, I think we are at the ultimate opportunity to make change in your business. Um, I would say in the Chamber Network, we have seen that there are going to be a lot of organizations that will not survive this, unfortunately, to hear that. But I think all these people on the call right now, by taking the time of being here today, you demonstrated that you want to be part of the new reality. You're ready to change. You're ready to think about your uh, invest in your business. And so it's now's the time. So I would encourage you to think about how to make time to plan for the future and plan effectively. So what can you say no to? What can you delegate? What's really not important so you can take some time to make a new strategy for your post COVID-19 uh, business operations. Secondly, I wanna talk about digital data. So now that we are working from home, we all realize that you can do it. We can operate dif differently. Uh, there's lots of new platforms that we're using. Um, lots of new tools and we've opened up our eyes to new things but I would say imagine the fact that we've done this without much planning we've just taken whatever exists and we've made it work how could how much better could we be if we'd planned we're strategic we're aligned and all of our tools were working effectively and um, cooperatively together so now that we've opened our minds to digital how can we do it better um, Operational or physical, we all know that we're working from home, um, some more than others. Some are using the office space more than others. But I think that this allows us to rethink what what do we really need for physical space? What, what maybe how much more flexible we could be? 
Um, I think about specifically a chamber or a not-for-profit, we often have lunch rooms, coffee rooms, boardrooms. Is all that physical space needed? Can we share with another organization? And I would say, don't think about sharing as um, a negative. Think about, about it as a positive. It's better use of space, but also better use of resources. Maybe you share your receptionist. Maybe you share your back-end staff. So it really opens up your minds to different ways of doing business physically. And it may provide opportunities, not just, what am I giving up? What am I gaining? I, boardrooms are a favorite for me. There's a lot of wasted space that get used maybe once or twice a month. Are you even going to have those board meetings in person anymore? And how often are they going to happen? So a lot of cost going out of an organization. So as you change the way you do business, you're going to have to look at new cash flow projections. So as an accountant, I'm spending a lot of time right now doing cash flow projections just short term. How do we get through uh, wage subsidies, rent subsidies, potentially short business loans. But then we have to think about what are those longer term projections as we go forward. And we really have to not take the old projections and just update them and move them forward. We have to really think about what is it going to look like in the new norm and challenge those assumptions and challenge how we do business so that we truly can be sustainable. Because right now, if we just do the things that we did before, we probably won't be sustainable. And once you've done all this analysis and, and contemplated some new decisions, it really is important to get all your stakeholders on board. So how do we put together a business decision so that everybody can understand the plan, why it's important, how it's meeting our strategy, what is, what is it going to look like, what are the steps we're going to take so that everybody's on board and they're behind you and on the bus to make the change. So really is, I would say, putting pen to paper to make decisions. It's, it's great to have a, a chat and a strategy, but if you don't put it to paper and people can visualize it, it's very hard to get your team on board. So I think that's really important at that point. So on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit of our own cash flow modeling. Julie, if you don't mind, oh, one more. Thank you very much. Um, so we are going to talk about when you're doing a new cash flow model. Um, I, I wrote keep it simple. I wanted to say keep it simple, stupid, and I thought maybe not appropriate in a formal presentation. But in reality, I would say that in most cases, I find clients try to get too far, too far in the details, and it almost causes you to stall. You're trying to make it perfect. So what I tried to highlight here is do not overthink the details. Make some reasonable assumptions and move forward. Because what will happen is you'll make a few decisions, you'll do a few scenarios, and you'll come to sort of your, your best case scenario, and then you can dig into the details further. So really don't overthink the details. Don't allow it to stall you. Make a reasonable assumption and move on. And as you move down the path, you can dig in, get more information, lean on your accountants, your bankers, other specialists to get more information. Um, look at a few key scenarios, and I would say maybe three options. So if you have too much information, you are going to drive confusion. It, it'll be hard to get your partners and stakeholders on board because they can't analyze the data as fast as you can. Um, I've sat there on my board, and we have a whole bunch of scenarios, and I need to get everybody to the key decisions, the key inputs. Um, and really focus on uh, a couple options. If you have too many options, you're going to confuse your stakeholders and you need everybody on the same page. And then the next items I wanted to talk about are focusing on those with material impact. So you'll see a theme here. Um, I, I noted occupancy costs. When I think about what are the checks that people are cutting, there's two big checks that you're really cutting. It's your salaries and benefits and your lease or, or mortgage costs, etc. So think about those big items first, because if you really want to have an impact, those are the ones that are going to do so. So think about occupancy. Can you reduce from um, big space to small space? Can you share space? That's how you can reduce. But around salaries and benefits, I really want to encourage people to look at what are the skills you need at the table and what are the people that can fill those skills. So we all want to protect people's jobs and keep people employed, but this is an opportunity to rethink around, are, is that person, do they have the skills to do the job? Can we do it with technology instead? And let's not think about somebody losing a job. Let's think about 
can they do something different that adds more value to the organization and they have better opportunities? It, it might be time for them to pivot and they might want to pivot. So really think about what is your staff complement? Can I use digital technology to do some of those tools? And can I repurpose those people to do something that gets more value for them? They're right in front of your customers, right in front of their donors. They're spending less time on non-value added tasks. So I really want us to focus on salaries and benefits and occupancy. And the next bullet I had there was around investment in technology. And I, and I actually reread this slide this morning and went, you know, investment's a scary word. People think big cash outflow. And I think the real part that we're going to get Ryan to talk about today is it really, technology isn't as expensive as it used to be. It is not a big upfront cost like it used to be but there truly still is an investment around people and change management. So you need to really be clear on your strategy and where you're gonna go, but now is the time that you can actually consider that. Um, we talked a lot today around, or sorry, in our group around, now might be the best time because you may have staff that have some time to help make change. So when you're going full bore in operations, you might not have the time to make change and make decisions, but right now you may have some capacity around making some changes. So this might be the right time to make investment, but to be clear, that investment might not be cash for uh, technology. It might be investing in time and resources. So I want you to also, once you make some decisions, really focus on your result. What is your outcome that you want? and delivery a business case that focuses on that. So particularly in a not-for-profit environment, that might not be um, profitability and it might not be a positive cash flow. It may be more around what is your value to your members? What is your value to those clients that you serve in the community? So really be clear on strategy. What is your KPIs or what is your key performance indicators? And make the decisions that align with that. And that is not always a cash flow or cash benefit. So, and when you're documenting your decision and getting your team on board, really document it in that way. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna first hand it off to Ryan and he's gonna talk about some of those barriers that we see with clients around moving forward and making change and some of the tools that you may wanna consider. And then after that, John's gonna chat a little bit around some of the risk management. As you make change, you open up risks and he can chat about how you manage those risks and help you help organizations through that type of change. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan now. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, as mentioned, I, I, my name is Ryan Burkholz. I focus on the technology uh, division or portion of our BDO consulting group. So I'd like to take the next few minutes kind of discussing some of the pains I'm seeing when speaking with clients in this new reality we all face. And then in the next slide, we'll look at some uh, technology we can implement to help uh, address some of these pains. So the number one kind of thing that I, I hear reoccurring when I, when I speak with clients is how do we stay in contact with our members, donors, and volunteers? How do we make sure that we're relevant? Um, we are face-to-face -face fundraisers and golf tournaments and such are being canceled. So how do we make sure that when the time comes that we need volunteers or we need donors, that we're on top of mind? So what tools are we using to stay in, in connection with them? Uh, secondly, how do we, how to effectively collaborate with our team uh, internally. Uh, today we're using Zoom, there's other tools like uh, Teams and, and such and Google. Uh, how, what tools are we using to effectively collaborate uh, internally to make sure that we, we are staying connected? Uh, third is uh, accessing critical financial information from a remote or home uh, workplace. And this one's a, kind of an interesting, I was working with a client two or three months ago when the COVID thing first started and we had to quickly scramble to find our workforce at home and they realized that they had 10 accounting staff that they couldn't access their financial system in the office on a, on a server. Uh, their VPN wasn't working or whatever the case may be, they, they were stuck. So we had to uh, work with them to, to quickly implement a robust online financial system so they continue to do their day-to-day -day jobs by paying the bills and, and uh, getting invoices out. So yeah, so it's important that we make sure that our financial systems are accessible from anywhere and, and not, we're not stuck or confined to an office setting. Uh, fourth, having information in multiple systems, spreadsheets that are not integrated. This is a, this is a problem kind of at the best of times, uh, even when we are working in the office, people have uh, their Excel spreadsheets or templates on their work or their desktops or, or own servers. Um, 
so how even we're now working remotely, how are we accessing these? How is everyone is, um, accessing the same information and making sure we're on the most recent uh, copies of things? Uh, the next point kind of uh, reflects back to the financial system, but uh, with the remote, remote workforce, how are we entering time? How are we doing expenses, how approvals for things like invoices and purchase requests? Uh, what systems in, are in place? Has that process has now been slowed? or is it is or more efficient with things that we've uh, implemented over the last few months. Uh, online program delivery. Again, with the face-to-face, -face, our uh, members or clients with the, are no longer uh, coming to our office for programs and delivery of those programs. How are we doing that? What tools are we using? And very similar hosting, as simple as hosting an AGM or a board meeting, what tools are we using to do that? Uh, for example, in board meetings, are we, is there voting requirements uh, needed? W what are we doing and how are we doing those voting? And lastly, kind of what have we learned over the last three, four months with regards to our new, uh, the new reality? Uh, are we per better prepared for a second or third wave? Uh, have, do we have, have we put technology in place to address some of these issues? And then on the next slide, you can flip, uh, Julie. On the next slide, we're going to look at some of the simple kind of uh, implementation technology we can implement <clears throat> to address some of these concerns. Um, one of the easiest digital strategies that we could implement uh, could maybe as simply as turning on Microsoft Teams or a product similar to it. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is aware on the call, but if anyone is running Office 365 or has a subscription of Office 365, you already own Microsoft Teams. It's just a matter of using the functionality. And a lot of people think of Teams or similar platforms of, uh, they're just video conferencing tools, but Microsoft Teams has much more to it as it could be used as a document management, internal external collaboration. It does have video conferencing, but it also has uh, a telephone capabilities. As well, you can use it for sharing or working on presentations, documents. It has check in, check out, and that sort of functionality. So it's a really useful tool. And just for everyone's information on this slide, we're using the term members uh, just for simplicity. But, a, but it, if you think about it, a member could be a volunteer, a donor, a contact. Um, just, but for simplicity, we're using the term member on the slide. Um, the second sort of solution we can look at implementing is, a, is an online CRM system. Uh, a rapid CRM implementation can uh, maximize your organization's data immediately and support a remote workforce. And the number one kind of tool or one benefit of using a CRM system is making sure that we are staying relevant and we are staying in contact with our, our members. Um, we can track uh, such things as interaction, emails, tasks, appointments. We could do workflow. Uh, one of the main uh, components of a good CRM system is fundraising or marketing campaigns. Again, when, when it comes time to, to reach out, um, we need the tools in place to do so and, and accessible to, to those tools. <clears throat> Thirdly would be a member portal. Um, a member portal is designed for internal as well as outside access. It allows your organization to streamline its communications and provide an area for users uh, to update and access information. Uh, again, the, probably the number one uh, benefit of a member portal is that self-serve functionality. So you can have your members or donors come in and do self-service. They could do onboarding, they can collaborate. Um, we've even done things like payment gateways in a portal. So you can have your members pay their monthly annual dues through the portal or even donors making donations to your organization. And lastly, uh, we've discussed it a few times in the previous slide, but that online financial system or ERP. Um, I find the number one reason or, uh, organizations are moving from uh, on-premise or in-house financial system to an online is they're just sick and tired of the maintenance involved with keeping things on-premise. Uh, your servers need to be upkept. You have to do your upgrades and your patches and you have to pay someone to do this, especially for a smaller organization or smaller nonprofit. It's, it's a heck of a lot easier to just pay a, a monthly uh, charity-based pricing uh, rather than, a, as Christine alluded to earlier, a capital investment in technology. Um, with the new technology, most ERPs are now online. Uh, they have uh, charity or nonprofit pricing. It's a monthly nominal fee, <clears throat> and you don't have to worry about the upkeep, the, the patches, the, the backups, all that sort of stuff is taken care of for you. And they're very secure at this point. So some of the benefits of an online ERP are obviously access from anywhere. It's an easy workflow and approval processes, ex expense claim processing. And then the nice thing is your executive dashboards or board reporting can all be online or accessible from anywhere. Um, 
with us doing online boards and AGMs, uh, you want that information accessible from anywhere as well. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suspect everyone to run out and implement all four of these uh, technologies <clears throat> all at once. But what I do suggest is everyone kind of take a step back or every organization take a step back, put together or think about your, where you are now, where you'd like to be with regards to technology and, and put together a digital roadmap. And, and, and if you do it over phases and in years, at the end of the day, you could have uh, a nice integrated solution where instances uh, exist where your members come in, they pay their, they log in, that information is fed to CRM, which is then fed to your financial system and vice versa. The financial information is relayed back to the portal. They can self-serve, they can see where their dues are at or, or what they've done. You can keep track of relationships and, and all these systems can, can integrate and talk with each other. Um, yeah, so, it, so at the end of the presentation, I'd be interested to hear uh, how technology has affected uh, your organizations and what if any technology have your organizations implemented over the few months and how has it worked uh, to help uh, ease some of this pain that we're all facing, I guess. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John and he's gonna speak about uh, planning for the new normal from a risk management perspective. All right, well, thank you very much, Ryan. And uh, it's nice to be chatting with all you uh, folks today. I, some, I see some of the, on the participant list, there's some familiar names uh, from uh, our, our presentation out in Kelowna last, uh, I guess late last, was fall uh, in November where we presented with United Way on various topics and uh, you know I, I, just as a reminder I lead our risk practice out here in, in Western Canada and we you know Christine talked about some of the challenges that you know the organizations are facing Ryan Ryan's talked about the technology side uh, and, and, and risk kind of follows with that you know what with challenges and, and need for change change in technology uh, you know that there's going to be some risk associated with that so are you planning for recovery and, and are you prepared for the, the new normal? Um, as, as organizations uh, are preparing to, you know, to be open facilities, uh, um, you know, there's going to be some shifts in for the new normal. Um, and, and, and so, you know, some of those require significant efforts or thinking um, and, this, you know, and, and also to, to ensure that you're complying with uh, some of the public health regulations that are, seem to be changing all the time. So, uh, uh, so with that, and, um, kind of steps that will assist you in, in planning for that recovery. Um, one, one is starting with re reassessment of risk. So, uh, and, uh, whether it's not for profits or, or small, medium-sized enterprises, you know, we all we all inherently uh, manage risk. But I guess the question is, you know, have you actually sat down and reassessed your risks? Have, have you? Have you gone through a, a, an exercise where you've actually sat down with your, your, you know, your, your executive team, with your board, and really reassessed your risk? You'll find that you know if you, if you do a, a formal risk assessment, you'll find that likely there's some risk that you already knew about, being eliminated, and there's other risks that you maybe didn't know about that have now risen to the forefront. So, um, keeping your eye on on the pulse of those risks and and coming up with strategies to mitigate them uh, is step one. Um, Secondly, review any business continuity or crisis management plans you have. Um, again, with not-for-profits and small, medium-sized enterprises, you may not have as robust of a plan as obviously like a Fortune 500 company, but you, know, you may have a policy in place, a procedure document, um, and some of these may be several years old. So now, now may be a good time to review them and also to take those lessons learned from you know, how you've operated over the last 12 months of this COVID period and, and did those plans work or did they kind of poke some holes uh, and with the lessons learned to say, hey, you know, we need to take a look at these and, and maybe enhance these a bit further. Um, that, that accuracy and, and uh, um, Christine talked about digital data and, and the need to, you know, the need to, to ensure that, uh, you know, you're, you're going, you have the technology requirements to ensure your system so, you know, working from home, does everyone have access to your systems? And it, does it promote cross-functional collaboration? Um, that, that's, that's quite an, important. And, and I think we've all experienced on the security side, um, how it seems like in the last 12 months, the, the cyber criminals uh, have had no mercy and they're in fact increasing the amount of, uh, threats and, and attacks on your systems, uh, phishing attacks. I'm sure everyone has been getting uh, more and more phishing emails. Folks uh, have been fostering, uh, you know, trusted people. And, uh, and so that's something to, something to think about as well. You have a security and we just lose that. 
um, would be to uh, would be to actually ensuring queer awareness uh, of employees and so forth. Um, uh, on third party dependency, uh, you know, review critical third party relationships. Uh, I know from an IT perspective, uh, a lot of small organizations will outsource the IT function uh, and there's other key services that you may be outsourcing. So how did those companies, uh, you know, were they resilient during this COVID period? Did, did they did they continue to operate? Did they have financial difficulties? So, you know, how, how reliant are you on those third parties and were you able to rely on them and can you continue to rely on them? And, and lastly, financial resilience. Um, you, know, you know, have you, have processes can, as you know, have you gone through this period of change? Have your processes, you know, ad changed and adapted and, and, and there's still good controls in place, you know. Um, one of the things you know that this environment has caused from work from home is then in some cases moving from a manual process to a more uh, to a more automated process. So are your systems set up for proper online approvals? Um, you know, receipt of online payments or e-payments. I'm you know, speaking with a, a member of a, a local church here, and they've completely gone digital for re receipt of uh, donations and stuff like that, and using text to get functions. Uh, you know, and, and 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 that might seem like an easy move, but the, you know, in the case where the congregation might be quite a bit older in demographic, do they have the know-how to how to do that? So you know, working through those risks as well. So um, and on the next slide, we'll we'll kind of talk about quickly how we. We worked with one particular not-for-profit and, and actually, you know, dealing with some of those risks. And, and so uh, this was a small not-for-profit organization um, that, you know, wanted to, their goal was to enhance the risk management practices. They had a risk management policy. They had a business continuity policy. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, they realized, you know, that there's, a, there's room for improvement. So not having a large budget, they asked us to just really have a look-see at, at their policy and document and, and just basically using our, our experts, uh, have a look to see where there might be room to assist with the, the enhancing those policies and, and risk management uh, practices. And so we, we work with them, con connecting them with our experts and really help uh, redraft those policies and plans so that they would have a more robust uh, you know, process going forward and, and should there be a second or heaven forbid third or fourth wave of COVID that they'll be, they'll be much better uh, able to respond and also be able to leverage the lessons learned uh, uh, during the, the last 12 weeks. Uh, and with that said, uh, I'll pass it back to uh, Christine. Thank you, John. Um, we did have a little bit of uh, technology issues in there, so uh, just it, we might get a few questions around that. Um, I really wanted to focus on, um, first off, I'm an auditor by background, so um, to John's pres part of his presentation, it really is, it's always nice to, t we talk about risk and think you should manage risk and, and it's easy to say it's not going to happen to me. I just want to highlight to all those in the call, I've probably had six clients this year that have been attacked with phishing scams, so people trying to uh, access my client data or, or cash flow, but also what we'll call ransomware, where they have actually taken control of people's data and stopped them from being able to do business by taking control of their data in, in exchange for trying to get money in, in return. So it is a reality. So managing your risk, although it sounds like uh, I don't need to worry about it. I just want to encourage everybody on the, on the call that it is important. Um, but then we sat down and talked about why now. Why is it time to invest, as I said, or make change? But um, I, I really think we have an opportunity right now. As I said, people have now got their eyes open to new ways of doing business, so they're open to change. Um, we talked about the fact that investment in technology really might not be a significant cash flow, but it, you may have the resources right now to implement change. As Ryan mentioned, it can be flexible. You can start with stages and, and add to those stages um, and modules. So you don't have to do it all at once. You can kind of get your feet warm, get people accustomed to a new idea and move forward from there. So we've got the opportunity. You may have some additional resources at hand right now. You may financially just need to do things differently to be resilient. So I really want to help, we all want to help our clients be resilient long-term, not through just the next six months. So we really want you to think strategically now so that you can be successful in the long-term. So, But we really wanted at this point to 
want to encourage you to make a plan and start moving forward. But if you have questions and if you, as Ryan mentioned, if you've actually used technology and you can talk to and, and it's easier to hear from other people around how did it work? You know, how did it really change your business? We, we'd like to open it up to some questions now if we can. Dan, were you going to? Yeah, uh, okay. So I'll uh, facilitate that. Um, it was interesting during John's presentation. I wanted to come back to Ryan and uh, say, Ryan, we got a technical problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's a good example, right, uh, yeah. of things that can occur. I want to move through uh, a few questions we had in advance uh, that we got, uh, and then we'll open up if anyone has um, any questions. Use your Q&A function. Uh, we've got some great resources, some individuals with us, so please um, uh, don't hesitate to, to pose a question. Uh, I'm going to begin, though, with a comment that came up, um, and likely to Ryan. Um, uh, someone in the chat had mentioned uh, Zoho One, um, and it astounds me in you know, how much technology and platforms, aside from those that are approaching us to sell their products, navigating that and knowing what's available um, and I might so if you could just explain if you know what Zoho one is so certainly someone online is promoting it uh, from a CRM perspective but then if you could just uh, make a comment um, and I guess one of the things we said management wise here is let's not beat ourselves up if we make a decision on the short term uh, that might not have been the wisest because we have an urgency to that's why we switched to Zoom, but looked at Teams, and now we're going, maybe Teams is where we should have gone because we're Office 365. So a couple questions for you, Ryan, if you could uh, provide some input there. So when I'm losing his mic, our fathers want to jump in. Oh. Hey there, Ryan. We have a mic problem. Oh, hey there. there I was on mute. Sorry, I, I had the double mute going and <laughs> mute on the mic and what? So yes, I am familiar with uh, Zoho One. Uh, it is a, it's a CRM platform. Uh, it's not, uh, it's one of many. There are, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people know, there are a ton of CRM platforms out there in the market. Um, the ones that we uh, at, at BDO support, or we're, we're a Microsoft office, so we, we support the Microsoft Dynamics uh, CRM and the Microsoft Dynamics Business Central and obviously Teams and, uh, and, and therefore, but we are aware of other ones as well and, and, and quite realize that there are um, multiple on the, on the market. Um, the second question is for Teams. Yes, so Teams is now included with your Office 365 subscriptions. Uh, Microsoft has since COVID uh, implemented that. Um, I believe the stat was staggering. The first month they had over 10 million new subscriptions to Teams. Uh, Microsoft did um, just in the first month of the whole COVID uh, pandemic and that did gear them to include it with any office subscription and even in future if it's not included to two three years from now if you qualify for charity pricing and Microsoft has like an E1, E2, E3 different platforms but if you qualify for charity pricing it's either free or one or two dollars a month so it's it's a very uh, cost-effective tool to implement uh, and especially I mean, the majority of us know Office products and we work with Office products daily. So it's, in, in most cases, it's, it's kind of an easy uh, transition. Ryan, just and, to, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Christine, jump in. I was just going to say, I think the key of the comment in the chat box is really the fact that they're integrated and that they work together. And as you said, not every, um, you know, you got to make a decision as you make a decision. Um, I would always, as the accountant, <laughs> I would just say, Think long term, not short term. So, is it a platform that can does have multiple modules so that you can implement over time? And is it a partner? As John said, are you partnering with somebody that has the security and the reliability in the long term? So, think about not just cash up the front. Is it a good partner for you that's going to work well with you long term? And that's that's a good point because we find we run into a lot of situations where uh, an organization will go out and buy something off the shelf. Um, which is which is fine, but then they want to go and implement an ERP system or something, and they don't talk to each other, and the integration doesn't happen. So you you end up, and, and we find this in the nonprofit charity worlds a lot because of, of costs and whatnot. Is you end up with five or six unintegrated, uh, at kind of antiquated systems that they're using that are kind of all over the place, but nothing is talking, and and it ends up creating more work in the end. 
Because so you're you're it, thinking about the cash for the software versus yeah. the the cost of your time and your people's time. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And processes and, and improving processes and that sort of thing. So. Yeah. Um, subsequent to that, I was going to ask, um, what guidance would you give those that uh, have joined? And I mean, nonprofits are pretty widespread. There might be large. Um, oh, for sure. Absolutely. Dollar organizations, or yep. there could be uh, church groups. Uh, so the variety yep. is is pretty significant. Uh, yep. But one of the things that, that we noted, um, and we operate as a nonprofit uh, corporation, uh, is um, as an example, even with uh, the software we're using with Slack, um, it, it's not totally integrated, but somewhat integrated with Zoom. There are also um, free aspects. Should nonprofits, because we're always conscious of money, so you go to where you can get software for free. Yeah. Yep. But I think about John's uh, aspects of risk management. Free doesn't always mean there isn't an, an impact. So any guidance you can give or um, general comments uh, to those that are joining us when they start to travel that um, technology path? Yeah, my, my suggestion would be to reach out um, to, to, to a trusted advisor and, and put together put together that one year, two year, three year kind of digital strategy roadmap. And, and it doesn't have to be a huge exercise. In some cases it is, as you mentioned, there are, there are million dollar nonprofits that we deal with and there's also uh, small organizations that we deal with. So it, it, it really is, we can tailor it to, to, to the organization, but I would suggest put together that roadmap and put together what kind of, what you want to do, where you want to get to, and, and work with an organization that can help you do that. Because like you said, there's a ton of free stuff out there, but it always necessarily doesn't work out in the end. And it kind of, it sometimes creates more headaches. And as John alluded to, it, it can open you up to a lot of risks and security and that sort of stuff as well. So I, um, I'll just make the observation, um, you know, Zoom as an example, and it's the platform we are, uh, is getting a lot of brand promotion. Uh, even I think I saw an, a national uh, broadcaster reference uh, Zoom. We're joining via Zoom. Skype was the yeah. previous one to that. And then we start to reflect on whether Microsoft was slow on the, off the mark in promoting Teams. But that's one of the questions we have. Uh, people are using Microsoft 365. Got a, this annoying reminder that Teams was there <laughs> because they never needed it. And now they're going, well, wait a minute. Could I have used that? So where do they access it? Where would they get that information? Um, and where would be a good source to get a little bit more information on Teams if they're already on uh, Microsoft 365? Um, there, there's, there's tons of modules or user um, cases and, and, and information out there. Uh, if anyone would like to know how to access Teams, feel free to reach out to me and I can send them a link and, and, and information. Right, and that, that's a good uh, comment. Uh, afterwards, we'll be able to share this presentation and the contact yeah. information uh, yeah. on the screen now, so. And I can, send to, I can point people in the right way for tutorials and self-learn and that sort of stuff as well. Right, so I mentioned and, a couple of software that, uh, I mean, we're using Zoom. Um, should there be any caution that we're exercising when we start to look at these uh, different platforms that are out there? Or is it get the guidance first before you initiate some free software? Um, I, I would I would always uh, recommend to get some sort of guidance before initiating free software for any organization. <laughs> but uh, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, and I think I'll just echo the whole yeah. don't assume free is good. So yeah. back to Ryan's comment, have a long-term strategy because once I think people forget that the people investment costs. So you need to, you may be moving data, you may be changing patterns and behaviors and that is time is money. So from that perspective, before you make any moves, you want to really think about your strategy longer term. Yeah. And even, even Zoom, which was, you know, used worldwide also had its security issues of people basically Zoom bombing and, and uh, had other security concerns, which they've now, sounds like they've addressed, but still, you know, even that, it was a very reputable free software that had its issues as well. So you never know. Yeah, it was interesting. You, you learn on along the way. We had a board meeting uh, yesterday and we had a, a, one of our board members attempt to join, uh, but we blocked because the name that they were using on the access was not her name. 
So she was logging in and unbeknownst to us, sat in the waiting room for half an hour. Because we we were being knocking on the door. Knocking on the door and we're going, we don't know you. Uh, but then she emailed and so there are all sorts of things that crop up. And even yeah. simply policies and procedures around, are you allowed to do a meeting virtually? So updating policies and procedures. So I've had a few council meetings lately where they're not allowing Zoom meetings yet because it's not in their bylaws. Yeah, and that's where I wanted to go next. If you could, uh, Christine, you talked about uh, running AGMs. Many of us, uh, after fiscal year end, are moving towards AGMs and are concerned uh, in BC. If you're, as an example, under the Societies Act, there is some flexibility uh, now uh, to do those electronic meetings. Any guidance you can give those nonprofits that are trying to figure out how they're going to do uh, those AGMs, and particularly. Okay, so how do we vote? Because there's been some disastrous attempts. I shouldn't say <laughs> disastrous attempts. Um, some, some challenging uh, situations that have arisen with nonprofits. They had to stop and then back up and try. So any yeah. guidance? Um, my biggest guidance would be prepare ahead and really test it. Um, I, Dan and I obviously participated in one on the weekend, which is more challenging because we had a weighted voting situation. But I think with the New Societies Act and one member, one vote. So I think in most cases, the voting is fairly simple. Um, so really thinking ahead, practicing. Uh, but I actually, because I deal with a ton of not-for-profits and they're small, I think we're actually getting better engagement at AGMs because people will attend and it's not a hardship or a challenge to attend. So being prepared that you might get people there that you didn't expect to get there. Um, and we've all run into technology problems. So the littlest things around just the proper mics and internet, et cetera, because be prepared for if something's going to go wrong. It, it is challenging. So, But I actually think it's probably going to be positive for us in terms of AGMs. But realize if you've got more people there, are you prepared? Like, have you, you've got a captive audience. Or have you got the message to deliver? Because it might be your, a good opportunity to capitalize on. And, and then on your point, uh, I, I also sit on the uh, not-for-profit board and we actually had our AGM yesterday. And so we actually um, sent out uh, our questions in advance of the membership through, a, I guess, a secure portal and we received all our results prior to the AGM. And so we were able to get approval of our financials uh, you know, new board members and so forth through uh, effectively like a survey feature all on our website and it went really well and we had good attendance and uh, yeah, we, were, we tested out the, the Zoom, we did through Zoom as well and we tested it out, did a dry run about a week in advance just to make sure the technology worked and we had control over who could see what, uh, kind of like what we're doing today and, and it worked really well. Are there any issues, uh, John, or, or potentially any of those that, with regard to freedom of information, protection of privacy, uh, particularly around software, as we see a software that's in the marketplace and we go, so who owns this and where is this data stored? And I'd like to use the voting, but that means I have to share my members' yeah. information. Uh, it can that be a bit of a challenge and want to make sure that people don't go offside with um, legislation. That, that's, a, that's a very good, good point because not all, especially when we're moving online to all these, all these online technology platforms, not all software remains in Canada um, or data remains in Canada, which is important with the Privacy Act and the, the United States being able to access um, sensitive data. Uh, the, the nice thing about the Microsoft products is they do remain in Canada. So if you were in Canada, it remains in Canada. They have data centers in Vancouver, uh, on Toronto and Quebec or Montreal area. So there is three data centers and you actually choose where you want your data to go and where it's redundant so it's backed up in. But, uh, but not all platforms are like that. They, they, your data may go to the States, it may go to a farm overseas. Um, there's no guarantee. But uh, the nice thing about Good Microsoft question is, to ask. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because it is very important, especially for nonprofits and some charity-based organizations that um, like in the healthcare division and, and whatnot, we can't they can, the data cannot leave Canada for obvious yeah. reasons, and it's it's private and whatnot. So, and if you so haven't yes, thought about it, you have, as a not for profit, you might not have thought about it yourself. But your funders will be concerned. So, if if you're getting government money or provincial or federal money, they will be concerned. So, it's a good question to ask. Yeah, and that transparency and communications around that issue is critically important. We have a few questions in the queue. Um, has COVID caused changes? And the liabilities of employers regarding safety in the workplace and any assets owned by the employer. Who's the leader in defining these changed liabilities? If you can 
So uh, let me, th I'm just making sure I understand the question. So I think, um, I think we still have the general same principles as we had before, but I think to, back to what we were talking about with John, is you need to do a risk assessment to say, has your risk changed and therefore do we need to react? So to the extent that we have employees working in different environments, have we assessed whether they have more risk and have we then adopted our policies and procedures? So I would say from a board perspective, doing that proper adjustment of your risk assessment is showing your due diligence that you are adjusting your strategy and your policies to to better address risks as they change. So, um, and uh, as a board member, you're never going to be perfect, but you have to show that you've actually considered and and tried to adapt. So, th and then you're going to have some directors and officers liability insurance. But I really, that all goes back to have you have you taken the appropriate steps and done your best. But maybe I'll pass it to John in case you want to add to that. Yeah, and I mean, and to, to that point, uh, you know, I think it is important to do those risk assessment exercises ahead of time because it shows you're being proactive and you can kind of nip those risks in the bud a little earlier on as opposed to being reactive and finding out because an inspector has been on site and you didn't follow health and safety standards or what have you. So if that is a big concern and you've identified that up front, then you're, you're spending that time ahead of time to you know, do your research and understand what you are required to do and what you should, what's recommended to do. And then you can put those in place. And, you know, if, if regulators come and see that you've been proactive and you've started to put measures in place, I think, you know, they're, they're going to be a little bit more lenient than, than in, you know, the after, after the fact where you haven't done anything because you haven't really addressed the risk. So I want to follow that up. Um, and it's a similar question we had when we had uh, representatives from WorkSafe BC uh, on a previous uh, session that talked about the responsibilities of employers. And in this circumstance, it would be applicable to nonprofits. When you have someone working remotely, you are responsible for their safety in the workplace, even if they're at home. Uh, have you seen or have you heard that? And have you given any guidance? Cognizant, you're not representing WorkSafe BC. <laughs> Uh, and there are likely some gray areas here, but uh, maybe that's where part of that. Are you hearing that that, that concern is being uh, raised by some of your clients to your employers when you have remote workers? I haven't heard much around the actual remote working. I've heard a little bit more around, you know, now I've got a home office and what does it cost and what is our relationship? But I, I, I'll start this off by saying I think you have to have a a new relationship discussion with your employees you know what what is how has it changed because i actually can't see into my employee's house how is that impacting you and therefore then we can have an intelligent discussion about what do we need to change so i i'm seeing a lot of clients doing surveys with employees around what is the impact how is it hurt positive or negatively impacting you how has it changed so then we can go back and have the right information to have a different risk discussion but i'm going to hand it off to john again and see if he's got more to add yeah i mean i i haven't heard anything in that regard either it's an interesting point i, I mean like i think you as an employee you are responsible on the technology side and how you're supporting your staff and getting connected and, and so making sure there, there's proper things there but uh, be, beyond that uh you know, I, 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 I'm curious what the liability would be from, from an employer perspective uh, in your work from home arrangements, you know, other than the technology that you're using. So, you know, you want to make sure the technology that you, you are using is safe and secure so that there's not other issues with uh, potential hacks or what have you. Yeah, I'm seeing more of a challenge around, well, not sorry, a challenge, anything where it's actually physical, people working and worried about security, it's more of, I'm going to say on the ground, say construction or um, city works and that type of stuff. And you have a lot of union involvement around the security and safety. So we have a question about uh, risk. Uh, they've put together uh, the reopening plan. They're ready uh, and, and putting it in place. Is it too late then to back up and do a risk assessment? Uh, it might be applicable on the technology side. We've traveled a path. Should we back up? Um, guidance in, in response to that question. Yeah, I would say there's never, yeah, there's never a bad time to do a risk assessment. And, and even those who had done one, say, at the beginning of the year for their strategic purposes, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things change between January 1st and, and March 15th, right? So. Um, and even between the start of COVID and, and 12 weeks later, uh, you know, risk will have changed. So I think, 
you know, whenever there's a need to, to whenever the risk uh, environment's changed, uh, I think there's a there's a need to uh, to do redo your risk assessment, and, and you can kind of can see how risk have trended too. So you'll in the last 12, 12 weeks, obviously a lot of m lot more regulations have come into place, and employee assistance, employer assistance um, that may have helped some mitigate some of those risks, but also presented other risks from complying with regulations and uh, from a workplace safety perspective. So, I, I think uh, I think it's always good to reassess risk, and it's not a very difficult exercise in the sense that you know if you if you do it through more formal ways, it's maybe a workshop with your your C suite, right, and and just this kind kind of voting on risk using clicky pads or online tools we did one the other day with one, one, one client and uh and it went, went really well with all everyone connected virtually so yeah i think the short answer is that ne never a bad time to, to assess risk especially when the environment's changed and i would say you might not be able to address them all right away but at least you have your list and you can prioritize and then exactly. go down the list over time yeah uh, we have a few minutes left uh, i've got uh, one more question but if uh, folks want to use their q a function before we wrap up uh, we will promise uh, if you're participating um, and we've got a reasonable turnout this morning uh, and i have a question afterwards feel free to contact the chamber we'll forward on and get an answer to you we'll make the slides available the contact information is on your screen uh, a couple questions so one i'll go to the one that's uh, been provided by one of our participants um, Christine, it comes back to uh, your discussion right off the top about scenario planning. Um, and interesting, you said how many multiple scenarios. We started with three scenarios um, and now we realize two are way off the mark. Let's dismiss those and we were trying to track. Uh, um, is there uh, software available or what guidance can you give about preparing and doing those cash flow projections? I, I'm going to be really honest and I see Excel all the time. <laughs> it happens all the time. People are comfortable with it. They know how to use it. But I think your example it goes right back to my point. You'll quickly assess which one is your most likely plan and then you can tweak and do that. Um, but I think the example is perfect. You've, you've narrowed two out. You've got one. You move forward. And I would say most people are using Excel. And I wouldn't recommend a super complicated tool unless you're a very big organization because yeah. they are extremely expensive, complicated, and hard to get on. But Ryan might want to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, with that, with that being said, yeah, there, there's many, many cash flow or forecasting, reforecasting tools on the market. They're actually called CPM, so corporate performance management tools. And there's probably four or five different vendors or ones that we specifically work with. Um, that integrate with our Microsoft tools. Um, some are big, as Christina mentioned, but there are some that are that are made for smaller nonprofits that are Excel-based and 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 help uh, quite a bit actually. And they've come down in price. Uh, one that we're working with uh, quite extensively now is called Vena. And if you'd like to learn more information, please feel free to reach out to me, and I can certainly provide that. But uh, yeah, there's there's Profix, there's Adaptive Insights, there's Vena, there's there's three or four on on the market that we. We work with and they, they don't just do cash flow they do projections and budgeting and all that sort of stuff as well and the majority of them are excel based which is easy to use yeah. so conscious we just start a little bit late we'll wrap up in the next uh 60 seconds or so here um might stretch a bit uh, and i might cause that stretch because of the question i might ask uh, christine i'll come back to you um oh, lucky and, me <laughs> uh, and, and potentially others because i uh, note uh, some of you mentioned your work with uh, other nonprofits. Uh, there are some staggering statistics out there um, and thoughts with respect to who survives this, uh, particularly on the nonprofit side. But Frank, we had a presentation uh, on the airline side and the airport side. Uh, there's an industry that's going to be massively impacted. Reflection by boards, whether you're a nonprofit, of how you're conducting business and thinking long term. Any guidance you can give, Christine, that, you know, can you reach out to others and look at collaboration um, and that type of thing? Please and, do. <laughs> right, so if you can make a quick comment about that and then I'll yield to a bit of a wrap up. So I might go back to your comment at the beginning. Lean on your accountants and your bankers and your lawyers because. Um, and lean on industry specialists because I would say I probably spend half my day introducing people, connecting people, all with the idea of let's serve the clients and the community better. And I, I really think now's the time to rethink. And, and I personally believe we have too many small nonprofits who are doing great work 
want to spend too much time doing back end administrative governance stuff that I think, so I'm going to say the nasty word amalgamation. I really think now is the time that take your ego aside, continue to do good work, but partner with somebody else or amalgamate with somebody else so that we can do all the good work with less overhead administration, etc. cetera. So um, I think that's the best of both worlds. People will survive, but in a new reality and maybe in a new model, but you could better bang for your buck return on investment to the community. So I, I, I think that's where you're going with the question, Dan. Yeah. So I guess, you know, there may be those that have joined us that run those organizations. Uh, some may be leading them from yes. a, a chair perspective. Where does that conversation start? Is it the, the board and frank discussions and the leadership of the, the chair or any guidance? I, I think it really has to start there and in your strategic planning and are we delivering on our mission and do we have such barriers that we can't get over it? And, and having a real open discussion about how can we do different th things differently, but be willing to have those conversations in your community or with other stakeholders, say your funders, say, say your competitors. Um, I really, that's why I love the not-for-profit sector. They're truly not competitive. You're both delivering services and how can we work together? And the biggest challenge I see when these go sideways is ego and forgetting that we're serving the community. So how can we both serve the community? So Folier, um, industry specialist, and that could be your accountant, it could be your banker, it could be your lawyer. Talk to the other people in the community. What do you see? And ask for their honest opinion so that you're really having an honest conversation up front. And I do think it's around the board. Are we delivering on our mission and can we do better? Great. Thanks, thanks Christine. We have uh, come to the end of the time we had scheduled. Uh, I want to thank uh, Christine Simpson, Ryan Burkholz, and John Asher from BDO. Their contact information has been on the screen for a while, but if you haven't captured it, uh, you can contact us or write it down quickly before we end. Yeah. Uh, some yeah. final thoughts, Christine? And I was just going to say, as the leader, feel free to always contact me if it's different specialized areas or whatever. I, that's sort of my funnel to just lead off to the right specialist to get the right people in. So happy to take any questions. And I want to thank you again, Dan, and the Hope Chamber for hosting us today. Yeah, I, I do want to uh, uh, thank all of you, and, and I'm going to use this for a plug. We normally, I'm in our boardroom, we normally rent that out to nonprofits or make it available to our uh, nonprofit members. We have about 150 as part of the chamber, but even to the community. We're not doing that currently, but we have the invested in the platform. If there are some nonprofits uh, that are members, just contact us. We'll make this platform available. I think there are ways we can all collaborate, even if you're in the private sector for the nonprofit sector, uh, we can work together because we will create uh, stronger communities in the long term, more resilient. So uh, John, Ryan and Christine, thanks very much for the information <laughs> that you have provided. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to wrap things up just by uh, uh, plugging our next uh, major events in the Okanagan Speaker Series. Uh, we had uh, Federal Minister Mona Forche on earlier this week. We're going to shift gears and talk about another challenged sector, tourism, that is facing some significant challenges, both in the short term. Marshall Walden, the President and Chief Executive Officer from Destination BC, will join us. On June 16th, it's a Tuesday uh, morning, and Michael J uh, from Big White, uh, they are uh, optimistic that things will turn a little bit as we get towards the winter, uh, but that tourism sector will be the focus of our discussion on Tuesday, uh, June 16th. Also, we are going to uh, venture out uh, outside, and we'll be holding our, normally it's, we refer to it as our golf tournament. It's going to be a day of golf, uh, and we've rescheduled it from uh, earlier this year to September 17th at the Harvest. It'll look a little differently, but we've been working with our partner, Park Pacific Projects. They've been great, uh, as has the team at the Harvest. So you'll find out more information about that. And we're doing our Business Excellence Awards. The nominations will open soon. We may be um, a television show that will present uh, virtually <laughs> come uh, October, November. But uh, think about it, we want to celebrate uh, the best of business and the best of our community as part of our Business Excellence Awards. Uh, that will likely be uh, the nominations in the next month or so. And then we'll do the celebration in October. And maybe we'll keep our fingers crossed with a gala um, in November or a virtual gala that uh, we'll have. 
And just a reminder, we're still celebrating our top 40 under 40. This is presented by BDO. Still a great time uh, to recognize uh, those young leaders in our community. You can find out information and still make a nomination as we're about three quarters of the way through. Um, but you can still nominate someone that you know that is providing great leadership or has in our community. Lots of information available on our website. I want to thank everyone that has joined us. I want to thank our guests and we look forward to seeing you next week on Business Smarts.